Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, good evening. Uh, I see you are all excited to be here. I think I'm also very excited uh, to be here today because this is something that I have looked forward to. I have called Joanne before concerning you know, some of these issues and we have talked uh, and wondered how do we take these things uh, to the next level. But I'm glad that you know we can get to interact um, as uh, youth entrepreneurs, as institutions working to empower women and youth, uh, as the government uh, and other stakeholders, private sector. Uh, this is a very great opportunity that we have because we have uh, a government that 
has set up precedent and said, you know, we want to take women and youth to the next level in terms of entrepreneurship. And we want to make sure that they are part of what the government does and they are included in terms of, uh, you know, the wealth creation in the country. And uh, it's quite a huge uh, thing uh, to hear the government say that 30% uh, of government contracts we go to, to women and youth. Those are billions of shillings. I mean, it's a huge uh, impact that that can achieve. So that's why we are here, and I think we are very, very excited. Just like to uh, say we have a very great panel with us today. Uh, right here, I think I'll start uh, with the lady uh, on the left, is uh, Stella Agara. She'll get to tell you more about what, what, what they're doing about herself. But she's the Deputy Executive Director of the African Youth Trust. Uh, and uh, they are working to harness uh, the productive energies on youth towards peace, equity, and sustainable development within and across communities uh, in Africa. And they have been involved in a lot of things. In fact, I, I believe I have encountered the director of the same organization when UN Habitat was actually setting up that youth fund. He was a key player uh, at that moment in time. So I, uh, I do welcome Stella Agara uh, on the left. And then uh, uh, next to her, we have a lady who has been uh, an entrepreneur for quite uh, a number of years. Uh, this could be counted as a, you know, equivalent to a degree or a PhD, you know, when you have that kind of experience in the business over 10 years, you know. So she's a lady who is an entrepreneur. Uh, 14 years, uh, she is in various, various fields. Uh, she's been in braiding, retail, property. So she's been there, done that. Uh, her name is Felicity Biriri. Uh, so please, welcome. Uh, Felicity from uh, FEO, uh, and she's also here representing uh, the Gender Social Development Sector Board uh, of CAPSA. Um, and then uh, next to her, we have a lady from UN Women, Adman Banu Khan. I hope I got that right. She's the Program Manager, uh, Women Economic Empowerment for UN Women. She's an economist uh, and a demographer. Uh, and uh, she has been working with UN Women, and they are focusing on the um, ensuring participation of the disadvantaged uh, and SMEs uh, in public procurement with various partners. Uh, so, do welcome uh, Ms. Kang, please, uh, to this forum. Uh, we have also from the Public Procurement Oversight Authority, uh, Mr. Haron Moti. Uh, he's the man. Uh, in the lady-dominated panel. Uh, he's the compliance officer at the PPOA, and before that he was an internal auditor at the Mary University of Science and Technology. He holds a, PA, uh, a business, uh, Bachelor of Business Management uh, Accounting and a Master in Business Administration uh, in Finance, and he is a CPAK and a certified uh, systems auditor and procurement uh, uh, auditor. So please welcome uh, Mr. Haron Modi. Finally, on the extreme right is a very, very passionate uh, lady uh, who has been uh, really championing uh, the issues of women uh, for a long time. I have encountered her in various forums, uh, very different in and outside the country. And her name is Wanjiro Gadela, uh, Managing Director of the Social Impact Institute Africa a capacity development organization based in Kenya, but working uh, at the uh, county level. She has been working on gender and youth issues for a number of years and is now focused on expanding uh, economic opportunities for Kenyans at home and uh, beyond. So please, our uh, very, very able panel. Now, we are here for a very exciting, exciting reason. And, uh, even before we get into, uh, you know, you know uh, probing these panelists about what is it that they have been doing and what is the understanding of the progress that has been made and what are their roles in whatever is happening, what I would like to actually ask them, and I think uh, I'll throw this at Wanjiro, but anyone else can feel free to just 
uh, respond to this is um, uh, five years ago, uh, President Kibaki did make a declaration about the 10% uh, uh, procurement of you know, contracts to, to, to youth and women. And then now comes Jubilee and they say they want to take that up from 10% to 30%. My question is, really, as exciting as this may be, um, does it have any legal implication? Is there any uh, institutional, uh, you know, assurance just have to review this down to 10% or 15%? Thank you for that uh, question. Um, a, a declaration is not uh, legally binding. Uh, it's just that it's a declaration. Um, for this declaration to become law, of course, you know, it has to become a bill, go through parliament, is legislated, and then becomes an act. Um, this is a very critical question, and I'm happy that uh, PPOA is here because um, they are the people who are responsible for uh, coming up with the laws on public procurement. Of course, together with, uh, with, with, with the legislature. Uh, perhaps PPOA would be in a better position, uh, Mr. Moti here, to tell us um, how far that process has gone. Yeah, that would be, that would be interesting. Please. Thank you. Uh, for that question about uh, the 10% uh, reservation for youth and women and people with disability, it was a declaration. So, therefore, there's no way a declaration can be implemented without having a regulation which is going to implement. So therefore, uh, as my colleague has said, Wajiru, uh, the authority is actually in uh, the process of amending the procurement law. Uh, hopefully, once the amendment gets an approval so that we have a regulation now which will guide procuring entities on how to implement those declarations. So as we are speaking, the declarations actually have not been implemented because we do not have a law that was guiding procuring entities to be able to implement those declarations. Thank you. I don't know, maybe Mr. Moti, you can tell us, is there um, a forum within which uh, people can be able to give feedback into you know, the regulations that are, that are being developed? Is there something like that? these people here can be able to interact with. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know whether you guys read the papers here. Have you read the papers? Because uh, this week, actually this week, we did an advert in the standard newspaper inviting people for a forum. How many of us have seen it? There is an email which uh, you can be able to submit your views on those things which you feel under the procurement law which you need maybe to be changed. Because especially, uh, not, not the procuring entities, but especially the suppliers and people involved, especially the young people and women, we actually be able to see those things which are not fully uh, favoring us in public procurement. You can actually be able to use that email, submit your views, but again we want to have an annual stakeholders conference which will be held, I think, in the month of July. July or June this year so that we can actually have, be able to have, have all those suggestions which you have actually submitted to us. So therefore, the public is actually fully involved, or is going to be fully involved in the change which are going to be made in public procurement. Thank you. Uh, I would like to um, uh, throw this question at the panelists, and I'll give them uh, each uh, at least uh, three minutes. Uh, to be able to uh, to give an answer. Um, what I would like to have you uh, explain to us is what is the role uh, of your agency um, in making sure that this uh, uh, procurement right that is safeguarded for women and the youth is actually realized as civil society, as private sector, um, as uh, an organization of women entrepreneurs, different stakeholders. What are you doing? What is your role? And how do you intend to take uh, probably this agenda forward? Uh, each panelist, I think we'll start uh, from the end, Wanjiro, uh, then we'll come this way. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 
Um, uh, as committee said, um, uh, Social Impact Institute Africa is a capacity building uh, organization. Uh, what that means is that we create awareness, we uh, train and build capacity, we do research and documentation, and we um, do policy advocacy, policy support and, implement, and implementation. And we also uh, build partnerships and alliances. Now, in this respect, this is not the only thing that um, social SII, we call it SII, does, but I'll focus our conversation just on, on, um, on public procurement. The PPOA government has opened the doors. We now have to do our part to participate. But there are certain things that you must do to become procurement ready to access government contracts. And just quickly, committee, allow me. What does it mean to do business with government? And what business are we talking about? I just want to say that the other thing that uh, SII is doing that is interesting is that we're, look, we're going to look at the value chain, say border border, okay? Youth have been left at, uh, youth and women have been left at ground zero. We need to move people away from, or move them gradually from point zero to 100. And how do we do that? Say, take border border, uh, youth, uh, a lot of youth are clustered in the border border business, fine. Youth can plug themselves in the Boda Boda value chain uh, based on their ca capability. For instance, you start off as a Boda Boda site operator, and then, but that doesn't mean that all the youth have to be clustered as operators. They can also sell spare parts, yes? They can also import the, 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 the tires and the other parts. Uh, they can also build the, 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 the Boda Bodas. Are we together? Yes. Why can't youth be the one, because as, when you look at the public procurement, the, the preference and reservation regulations, they say that assembly of cars has been set aside, that is one of the things that has been reserved for women and youth. We need to start changing our minds about where we plug in the youth. The youth themselves have to change their minds about where they are plugged in. The, the roads in the county level will not be done by the Chinese. They will be done by youth companies and women companies and co companies owned by persons with disabilities. And this issue is not about the youth. Because they, they, even though we are working with the youth, we have a rationale for why we are working with the youth, with why and Women Enterprise Fund, and why we are working with, uh, with the youth fund, and why we are working with women, with UN women. They are different sides of the same coin. The strategies are different. But the aims and objectives that we hope to achieve are the same. Okay? So we are saying we want to plug youth in with, with companies. When the Chinese are building these roads, we need to make sure that youth companies are shadowing them so that they end up building and maintaining roads. Are we together? It's a different conversation. And we'll continue to have it as we go along. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, PPOA. Please uh, be brief. Okay, thank you. The role of PPO in uh, public procurement is actually to act as a regulator to regulate uh, both sides, the procuring entities and the supplier, and mainly on the procuring entities. One, to ensure compliance of the public procurement and disposal act. Because uh, it's through compliance that youth, women, and people with disability are actually going to enjoy this uh, public procurement within the country. Two, we actually ensure Within the public procurement system, there is fair competition. That means suppliers can be able to fairly compete and win tenders fairly. Is that okay? So there is maximum uh, competition within the suppliers. And three is actually to ensure procuring entities obtain value for money in their procurement. And there's something I want to mention, that however we are reserving these tenders as the government uh, for the youth, women and people with disability. That is not a guarantee that you'll be supplying substandard products. We actually going to have, once they roll out that program, people is going to participate. It has already participated. I think uh, some organization, the time you were having uh, the women trainings, uh, we participated and we actually showed women on how to fill tender documents, how you can be able to actually even uh, comply with those provisions and all that. So uh, I think, and the last thing is, we do policy and research. The policy and research is actually through getting your views as the people, the stakeholders, and now from there, 
we can actually be able to incorporate those uh, feed, uh, your views in the procurement and uh, the procurement law. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as he said, my name is Banu Khan. I'm Kenyan, uh, so I can mix a little bit of Kiswahili, and I'll try. Um, first of all, I would like to start by saying that yes, I'm here on uh, representing UN Women. For those of you who might not know, UN Women is the United Nations entity for gender equality and women's empowerment. And in Kenya, we are doing very many interesting things. I will not talk about everything because the focus of our discussion today is more about uh, public procurement and that falls directly under the program that I am managing, which is women's economic empowerment. Now, um, uh, for any UN agency to, to work in any country in, in the world, uh, our primary uh, reason for being in that country is to uh, work with the government of Kenya to help the government achieve its national priorities. Otherwise, we have no business being in that country at all. That's our mandate. Work with the government to help them achieve their national uh, priorities. So the same applies to, to Kenya. We are here so that we can help or work together with the GOK to realize our national priorities as uh, uh, stipulated in our development blueprint, which we all know which one, which one is this. Louder? Yeah, Vision 2030. So, um, now coming more closer to recent developments. Yes, we have the Vision 2030. Yes, we have a new government now in place. But what we are seeing very clearly is that while the, uh, the government aspires uh, for Kenya to be a middle income country by 2030, we are really not yet quite there. We want to have a 10% economic growth rate in order to reach our goal of being a in, in middle income country. But the problem is that when we look really deep down, there are certain sectors that are considered the drivers of the economy. And I'm emphasizing here because I want to hear from you again, the members here, where are our women concentrated? Which sector is this? Fantastic, this is a very good group. Yes, it is agriculture. More than 70 to 80% of our women are in the agriculture and we are trying very much that youth also uh, start seeing agriculture as a viable, uh, you know, you know fantastic, um, uh, viable, interesting sector to, 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 to come into. Now, when we look at agriculture, where women are and quite a number of youth are also, so we have gone down, as Vanjiro said, all over the country and we have talked to women entrepreneurs. Uh, we've been in five regions, Nyanza, Coast, Nairobi, um, uh, where else have we been? We have been to Mount, Mount uh, Kenya, which is uh, eastern, as well as Rift Valley. Majority of the women are, yes, confirmed, engaged in the agricultural sector. But when we ask them, what is your problem? Why are you stuck at the subsistence level? There are two emerging issues. We are stuck there because we have lack of access to markets, and we are stuck there because we do not have funding. And we are sitting here on the other side and saying, aha, uh -huh, but there is a huge market out there, public procurement, that you are not exploiting. You are not taking up that responsibility. And public procurement all over the world, not just Kenya, is, 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 is very critical because of the size, the sheer size of that sector. We were just discussing before we started here, what is the current, what are we talking about in terms of money, just money? 1.6 trillion is our uh, budget, annual budget, current budget for the government. Of this, estimated 70% goes to public procurement. So, who are the mathematicians here? Calculate 1.6 trillion, and out of that, about 70% goes to public procurement. So, what are we talking about? About 300 billion that is reserved for certain target groups. And these target groups are not even aware of that opportunity. So our business as UN Women, in short, is really, you know, in, in, my, in my program, uh, the focus is on agriculture, the focus is on bringing, lifting women out of subsistence into wealth creation, and for me, the definition of wealth creation is have assets, have, um, uh, what was it, uh, create wealth, and uh, have uh, business leadership skills lead because every time and this is very disappointing for me and I put it as a challenge when I ask anybody name me the five, top, top 10 business entrepreneurs or business people in our country the list starts with who can pick up a name <laughs> okay so you get the point huh? 
my friend Felicity is hardly ever mentioned and she makes billions. She makes billions. So anyway, <laughs> she will tell us. So we are trying to have this transition. We want to take lift women into this business leadership um, uh, spectrum. And in order to do that, we are looking at the whole concept of markets and, 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 and of course, um, uh, you know, the state market being key. Felicity. Thank you very much. Banu, I want to answer why I'm not among the top ten. I'm disadvantaged. Yes, I'm in the disadvantaged group. So I'm a businesswoman and I want to, t to say here, I am a serial tenderer. I buy tender documents in the newspaper. I fill them. I am procurement ready because I get letters from all these institutions telling me that we received your tender documents and that you are now pre-qualified to be a supplier in this institution. However, that is the last communication I ever get from them. <laughs> they never get back to me telling me to put for anything. They never ask me to quote for anything. And when I quote, I don't get. Okay? So Banu, that's why I'm not in the top ten. And so, having said that, um, I am an entrepreneur of many years. Um, most of my clients are private sector and multinationals. I know government tendering is big business. You've had the mathematics. 1.66 trillion, 30% of that is a very big figure. I only need one tender a year. Yeah? I only need one tender a year, not many. And I'll be good because you see, as a business person, to be to diversify, isn't it? Yeah. So you need to have clients in private sector, in government, in civil society, everywhere. You supply everybody, isn't it? You cannot rely on just the government. So we are saying that the private sector has opened up to us, the international community has opened up to us. I am a supplier of the United Nations, but I don't supply the government. Why? Because it's cartels. They are very, very serious cartels that cannot be broken or gotten into. So we are very happy with the government because the government has come out clearly and said we want 30% of public procurement to go to the disadvantaged yes, in society. However, like the, our, our facilitator said, five years ago there was another declaration, yes? PPOA itself here has said this is not a law, okay? So we have no way of, of ensuring that it is done. Yeah? And I'm very happy with Banu and uh, Wanjiro because they are going around the country and trying to um, tell women what is public tendering. Because there are a lot of people who don't even know tendering. They ask me, they tell me those documents are too complicated. I don't even want to try to fill them. So number one, we must start with registration of businesses registration with statutory bodies, be registered with KRA, pay your taxes, NHIF, NSSF, so that your procurement ready. However, we are, we are raising the red flag and saying, even if your procurement ready, we have to have a roadmap for the implementation of this directive from the government. Yeah? So for us, for me as a person, that's why I decided that, you know what, I'm a businesswoman. I'm alone. There's nothing I can do on my own. So what do I do? Step number one, join the Federation of Women Entrepreneur Associations. That way, instead of me speaking on my own, we'll be speaking as a group of women. We can be able to partner with UN Women. We can be able to talk to PPOA. We can be able to talk to government as a group of women. So we have been engaging and lobbying government and begging for this percentage. However, we are saying, please, can you make it law? The same way we've been talking about gender, yeah? We ensured that it was in the constitution because, you know, once it comes into the constitution that 30% of anything must be gender sensitive, isn't it? Now you can see that it's bearing results because it's entrenched in, in law. So at the Federation of Women Entrepreneur Associations, what we have done, we have partnered with other groups. We are a member of KEPSA, for instance, Kenya Private Sector Alliance. I chair the Gender and Social Development Board. And what we intend to do is that the Procurement Act, we want to ensure that our voice is heard in that bill so that by the time it's going to Parliament, or when it becomes law, it will be entrenched in some form of law. 
then that way PPOA can be able to tell every institution and every ministry, what was your budget this year? One billion. How much did you give to women? <coughs> Which companies did you give? How do you know these companies are owned by women? Because also, like for instance in South Africa, they had the Black Empowerment Program. Yeah? It, everything comes with its own challenges. And we as women and as youth, we have to be vigilant. Because you know what I was reading in the paper the day before yesterday? And somebody said, whenever one group gains power, there is another group that is losing power. Do you think the group that is losing is happy? No. So really, it's not going to come on a silver platter. Yeah? We have to, be, uh, to ensure that we are vigilant. We have to ensure that it's entrenched in the law. We have to ensure that we are procurement ready. We have to ensure that we give value for money. We have to ensure that we give quality goods so that, because you know we could be entitled to this 30%, but they'll say, you know what, every time we give women entrepreneurs, they give us low quality goods. So there'll be another law now saying that we think we need to scrap this 30% because it's not working, isn't it? So we need to be vigilant. We need to prepare ourselves. We need to partner with everybody to ensure that as women and as youth, we are procurement ready and we are able to um, implement or rather to follow up or monitor the implementation of this 30% dec decree because as of now it's just a decree, it is not yet the law. And then uh, we give feedback, you know, we ensure that they report. For instance, in the performance contracting, we want to engage the Ministry of Planning and tell them it must be in the performance contract of every organization that they go to sign at KSEC to say that they'll employ 30% and that they will give business to women and youth up to 30% or to SMEs or to whatever it is so that when they go back to be marked or to be evaluated it will clearly show that they scored here, they scored here, they didn't score here and that should be one of the parameters for the measurement of their performance or success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I am actually glad I'm speaking after Felicity. How many people in this room are youth by a show of hands? In your small business, any of you suppliers of the UN? One. Thank you. Now, um, I work for the Africa Youth Trust, like you are told by, by committee. Africa Youth Trust is a trust registered in Kenya, but with an Africa wide mandate to promote youth led development. We work every day to promote youth participation in governance and economic development processes. I'm going to focus heavily on the economic development component because that's the subject of today. However, you can visit our website www.africayouthtrust.org to get information about whatever else we do. And in terms of entrepreneurship, we're actually giving them entrepreneurship training. We're giving them support to be able to set up businesses. When I say support, I don't mean money, but know-how to set up businesses. We are linking them to microfinance institutions to provide them with seed capital. We are doing frequent information meetings to provide them information on opportunities, market opportunities, and other opportunities for networking in terms of business. The subject today, however, is not building the capacity of them to be able to supply um, samosas to, to a small company. It's about trading with the biggest uh, business partner in this country who is the government. So do we, are we, are we having this conversation for the first time as youth specifically? I'm still speaking to the youth. We are not. For those of us who are in this room who are familiar with the Kenya Youth Empowerment Program, you would know that this is not the first time we're getting a quarter of the procurement in this country. Under the Kenya Youth Empowerment Program, we were given 10% of government procurement. It was discussed in a boardroom. It never got to the point of, of, of regulations and therefore was never implemented. Never implemented in the, in the sense of being done deliberately through advertising and ensuring that youth know and getting as many businesses, even if it's just through the Ministry of Youth Affairs, to take advantage. Never implemented in the sense of monitoring to see how many youth, by constitutional definition between the ages of 18 and 35, are actually accessing those businesses. Never implemented in the spirit of trying to find out, okay, so now that they're getting these businesses, is it promoting sustainable livelihoods for them? Are they getting money and drinking all of it? Are they able to employ their people and create employment? How many jobs are being created by giving this number of procurement opportunities to use? It was never implemented. I think I'm extremely happy again to speak after you have been told that this was an election promise. If you do not make sufficient noise, it could be forgotten like many other election promises. So we must participate, we must engage all processes to influence the regulation, to ensure that the regulation is in place, to ensure that nobody reduces it to 25%, 
And then, for the youth, to ensure that that, that 30% is split what? 50-50. Because if it is not split, Felicity here, and the members of the Federation of, 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 of uh, Women Entrepreneurs, at least are suppliers of the UN. So they are somewhere close to being procurement ready. How about you? Who is registering your business today? And since you have been harassed by, by, by the city council, you have run here so that you can get information on how to ensure that that business is registered. <laughs> what happens to you when these opportunities come about and you're competing with Madame Felicity? She is more likely to get them before you do. So this 30% must be split what? Into half. We will fight for Felicity for sure. But then we must fight for our half to be secured for youth. And if they do not get that one youth business, that can be able to get the government tenders, then let them organize in such a way that all the programs they are running will build the capacity of young people to either partner or do whatever it is to access those business opportunities. It's called affirmative action. Under the previous arrangement, the banks would give loans to any youth business. If you approached a bank with a tender to confirm that the government is actually awarded the tender to you, the bank would give you the entire loan to service the tender. Of course, you'd come back and pay the loan plus interest and then remain with whatever you're left with. But if you're left with even 300,000 out, uh, out of your tender, you're better off compared to where you had zero shillings. So what are we teaching the youth as, as far as all, those, all that is concerned? We are giving them information constantly about all the tenders that are published by the government. Many times youth do not get access to newspapers. They don't get to read and know that there's a tender that has been published. They don't even know what to do when a tender has been published. Do you, do you sit there and, and, and wait for someone to come and tell you what to do? Or do you walk to the ministry and pick the tender papers? Where else can you get them? Can you download them online because we are digital? What do you do? Then apart from that, we also enable them to understand that if you are going to be delivering services to the government, there's a certain quality that must be maintained. And if that quality is to be maintained, you cannot promise to deliver stedler pens and then go and look for some other stretch pens and deliver to the government and expect to be given the tender the next time. Remember, it is extremely competitive. And uh, after doing that, we are also speaking to the young people to be very vigilant, and I'm glad Felicity has spoken about it, of corruption within the tendering process. We are teaching them to Mulika Mwizi. If tender boxes have been opened and you have seen the number of people, organic, companies that have tenders, there are six. Then the next time you come to have a conversation with the government, you're dealing with 12. You have to ask questions, right? So we are also looking at corruption at different levels and empowering young people to be able to report corruption and to deal with corruption and even to be able to audit elements of our national integrity system, including procurement agencies, on uh, uh, procurement. And we have done that with the health sector and the local authorities to just review the, the delivery of services and procurement within those sectors. Thank you very much. I think uh, we can now move the mic to uh, just for this place. Uh, Mr. Hedwig Nyaloa. Uh, my name is Hedwig Nyaloa. I am the head of secretariat of the Kenya Institute of Supplies Management. Uh, this is a professional body, you know, very much like I spoke for the accountants or LSK for the lawyers. So we basically um, look after professionals in the procurement and supply in terms of their capacity development needs and also in terms of uh, representing them and lobbying with specific stakeholders such as the PPOA and the central government. Um, we are also uh, very conscious of uh, the directives which have been coming out, particularly the issue of uh, allocations to uh, disadvantaged groups. And in fact, I think the earliest allocation uh, initiative came out in 2005 in the uh, government uh, policy paper where they say that 25% should be going to the micro and small uh, and medium enterprises. And we know that nothing was done uh, after that. And uh, last year we had 10% uh, also offered by the, the government of uh, President Kibaki. And also we are aware that uh, not much really has been done in terms of implementing that. And right now we are looking at 30%, yeah, which is an even bigger uh, task. Uh, the one thing which we are conscious of is also the issue of capacity to implement, because the, the procurement field is very complex, particularly for the people who are charged with the responsibilities of implementing. It is uh, actually, if you talk to a professional, he will tell you it's like walking through a minefield. 
because many of them are overly cautious and because of being overly cautious they are failing in trying to be innovative and to extend some of these uh, privileges which are being put across for the youth because uh, the issue of preferences has been there for a long time in the law even without regulations and we know that it could have been implemented and defended if a practitioner could come up with a business case present it to his CEO or to the PS in the government department and actually tell them that this thing is in the law and we need to do it. It can be done. And that is what we are telling our members. And we also have evidence that some of them have actually tried to do it. Uh, some have achieved at least some minimal levels of success, though it is not wide, widespread. And it is an issue that we are still working hard to try and reach out to more practitioners all over the country talk to them and show them that these are things that they can do. Uh, but we also have a big uh, problem in terms of the gaps which exist in terms of skills and knowledge. Uh, actually, most of the skill and knowledge is in Nairobi, Mombasa, Kisumu, Nakuru, the major centers. When you go beyond that, you will meet uh, practitioners who do not have qualifications, but they have been given positions. So those kinds of uh, professionals, uh, in quotes, cannot be expected to really do much because they may lack the capacity to read the laws, the regulations, the manuals, and understand them and implement them. So as KSM, our key strategy, our key role, is to increase that capacity. And we are setting out on this journey by first of all coming up with a national qualification for practitioners. We are working with CASNEP, this is the Kenya Accountants and Secretaries Examination Report, and I believe that by the next year we'll be able to administer exams countrywide, yeah, from the levels of the clerks up to the managers and professionals. So I think uh, people should be encouraged, you should not fear, and also if you're organized as groups, you can also talk to KSM uh, on issues of developing capacity for you as suppliers. You know, you just highlighted that very critical stereotype. We, I, I think we are used to dealing with a corrupt government. Is, is that a perception or is that something that we need to recognize and ask ourselves? Is corruption such a big challenge so that we don't ignore it? Because there's a lot of apathy on the side of uh, women and youth when you ask them to do a tender, when you ask them to apply for a job, even I mean, let's say that one, uh, I mean, I, I, know, I know no one in that place, so what, what do you think? I'd like to get your views on that. I think let's not uh, just call it, it could be, it, it's a deter I mean, the fact that we've been dealing with a corrupt system um, has made people become, you know, they don't want to deal with the government and they don't want to... Because like I, I, I apply for tenders every other day. If you come to my desk, you will find I have cut and cut newspaper cuttings and cut so many of them. And one business person asked me, Felicity, why, why do you bother with tendering anyway? I mean, it doesn't, you will never get anywhere. In a sense, they are right. Because like you can hear, the only communication I ever get is to be told, you have successfully been pre-qualified and nothing else after that. So it is real. But then again, I tell them, you know what, um, sometimes you might just get it. So don't give up. But we need to know for how long should we try before we give up. So the corruption is real. And I think the only way to give public confidence again is when we start seeing these institutions reporting in the newspapers. PPOA has been reporting which tenders have been given to who, three, four pages. Now we need another column there saying, who owns this company? Is it male or female? Yes. We want another column saying, is this youth age. or age? We need the data to be more disaggregated. Yes. So that now we can know that if you don't, if you don't get, it's because you have not applied. Like we told PPOA, in fact at one time we thought, we've been engaging for long, I mean like you can hear, we've been in business for long. So at one time we thought PPOA is also gender insensitive. Until we met the deputy CEO of PPOA, who is a lady, and she assured us that, do not worry, PPOA is not gender insensitive. It's just that 
there are certain there are, thing, there are ways things have to be done and we have to ensure that they are done in the right way. So let's have those other columns, Mr. PPOA, added, you know, at the end there. Say whether this company is owned by a lady or whether this company is owned by a youth. And then at the bottom there, you say all this procurement, this percentage has gone to foreigners, this percentage has gone to SMEs. This give us useful data. I want to ask how many people in this room uh, know about the Public Procurement and Disposal Act? Hands up. This is, this is a quick, uh, indeed, hands up, okay, hands down. How many of us know about the Public Procurement and Disposal Preference and Reservation Regulation 2000, 2011? Okay, the numbers are reduced. <laughs> How many of us know about the regulations for 2011? Hands up, okay. How many of us know about the county government regulations for 2013? Okay, now we are getting somewhere. This is where the problem starts. And I was hoping that we could have a conversation about the legal and regulatory framework for public procurement. Okay? Because if you don't have the information, we are clapping that Dada, she hasn't been able to do it, but it's a function of knowing and not knowing. There is a preference and reservation scheme that reserves certain procurements for the youth, for women and persons with disabilities. Are we together? Yes, and, it and, and that, those procurements will happen only at the county level. Only at the county level. Which means that nobody, uh, those, re those procurements are, only re are reserved already for you. It's an affirmative action. So those regulations are actually couched. Okay, before they were couched under local authorities, counties and constituencies. So ideally, you could have applied for some of those, and what is reserved, Moti? What is reserved is goods mined, extracted, manufactured in Kenya, assembly of motor vehicles, there are certain things that are already reserved. Okay? Which means that if youth and women, persons with disabilities, they are called by the law disadvantaged groups, are not procurement ready, there will be a problem in terms of filling those standards. It's an affirmative action. That means when you are procurement ready, you go, you tend up to pay Okay? That, that, even better, even better within the regulation, it's saying that the, you don't need to have tender security. For youth, women, persons with disabilities, and another thing, you cannot say 30%, 15% is for the youth. The law does not look at it that way. Because it has put women, youth, and persons with, uh, with disabilities as a disadvantaged group. Plus, micro and small enterprises, which means if you're a man and you're over the age of 35, and you're not a youth, you're not a woman, and you're not a person with disabilities, you can still qualify. And then there's something called a contract framework. Which means if you are supposed to pro uh, supply something like, a, let's just pick a lower figure, 100 uh, uh, reams of paper. Under a contract framework, uneza patiana kolepo, kidogo kidogo. Okay, so that you can afford it. Please. Thank you so much. It's actually getting now water. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I want to actually say, uh, there's something uh, I mentioned about pre-qualification. Yeah? I wanted to give a, a clarity that uh, you are suppliers, once you have been pre-qualified, the only communication which I'm told you get from the procuring entities, yeah? that you have been successfully pre-qualified for this financial year under the supply, for example, category of uh, beef or stationery. It is your right, and Wanjira has actually mentioned that most of us do not participate in public procurement because of ignorance. It is your right. If you have been pre-qualified, it is your right to get a quotation from that procuring entity. Are you aware of that? You are not aware. Because if you are aware, the moment it actually reaches our financial year and you have never gotten any communication from the procuring entity, you actually write to the procuring entity to tell them the reason as to why you have never bought a quotation and you have been qualified. Is that okay? So it is actually your right. And most of us, it's actually an issue of perception that we don't want to participate in public procurement because we think the system is corrupt. 
Okay, let, let me just let, let me just let, let me just finish here. Give me time, yeah. So what I'm saying is this. What I'm saying is this. And I want to ask. I'll give you time. I'll give you time. Yes, I want to ask. How many of us have ever won tenders in public entities without knowing anybody? By a show of hand. There are very few, yeah. How many of us have won tenders in an institution where they know people? <laughs> So where are you? Because I'm actually wondering. Because where are you? Because it means either. Because let me tell you, corruption is actually mitigated from the private sector. The people who are more corrupt are the people who are suppliers. Yes, yes. Because if you, if I'm a procuring, I'm a provision. Kissim is here to regulate the the provisions. I'm a provision. When I'm asking for, for example, some money, why do you give me? Because you know, you rightly tender for that tender, and you are born for that tender. Is that okay? So, what I'm saying is this we have a new constitution. Do you agree with that? Yes. We have a new constitution. We have uh, new regulations, which are actually there to benefit us as youth and women and people with disability. The problem was, and this is the reason as to why it has not been implemented. One, when the preference and reservation scheme were actually uh, gazetted, the, the right to give business to the youth, women, and people with disability was left with the procuring entity. What do I mean? The institution, for example, we talk of, uh, let me, uh, media is here, not, okay, I don't know. Let me use an example of XYZ, an institution, yeah, which is a government institution. So it's the procurement manager to say in his procurement plan, that I'm going to serve these tenders for the youth. But it is extremely important that, that uh, I make this comment. Uh, one with reference to the fact that I insisted that the 30% must be split 50-50. And number two is with reference to the law. The laws of Kenya say that not more than two-thirds of the members of the National Assembly and any representative body shall be of one gender. Our National Assembly right now, does it have a third woman? No. no. What am I trying to, to point out right now? I'm saying the laws might be very good. The problems in Kenya are not in the law. They are definitely, definitely not in policy and not in law. They are in the implementation. Yeah. What we should be debating is how to ensure that we are either vigilant that the law is being implemented or that if we are, we are duty bearers, we ensure that then the law is implemented to the letter. That is number one. And number two, we cannot close our eyes to some of the, the impediments to the smooth implementation of the law in this country. And one of them is the corruption that is affecting procurement in this country. But number two, it is the fact that very many of our, our laws, very many of our policies are not known to the public because there is no deliberate attempt to inform the public about them. The Constitution of Kenya requires that the government informs the public about every single policy and every single law they pass through a public mechanism. Right now, I'm sure this information is only available on your website. And so those that are laws are available on the Kenya Law Reform uh, website and any other website that provides those laws. How about those young people, for example, youth, who do not access that information in Wajia and they want to access government procurement? How do they get this information? They have district youth officers on the ground. Why not tell the district youth officer to disseminate this through a public forum so that as many young people get information and they start sharing with fellow young people and need to know about it? You cannot blame women and youth for not knowing when nobody has come out to tell them this is what is happening. And for me, I am certain, I am certain, the reason why there are no big attempts to ensure that people know is because this is a very lucrative business and we have to accept it. IBC told everyone you have a right to vote. They went on TV, they went everywhere. Where is PPOA? Why are they telling the youth in the media that you have 10%? It has now been increased by the Jubilee government to 30%. This is how we are operationalizing it. You know? The people cannot be able to implement a declaration. If I ask you, how, how can you be able to implement a 10%? It actually becomes, yeah, it is actually a policy. Okay, on the issue of uh, maybe people knowing, we are actually, I think that's what Banu was saying, that we have actually gone around to train people and so many people. And the issue of actually having your views, I said we have done an advert and we have given an email where you can actually be able to do what? Present your views. Is that okay? Yeah. This is a sample of people in Nairobi. 
So if people in Nairobi do not know, how much worse is it in machine learning? And, 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 actually, yeah, just, please. But I want to look at it differently. I think we should not always, always uh, lament and say we don't know, we don't know this, we don't know that, we, uh, you know, blame the government, blame others. I think we are at a different uh, stage in, 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 in the dispensation of our, of our country. New constitution, new government, new, new structures through devolution. We, the youth, and the women and everybody, me included, have to be more proactive. I want to just ask a very simple question. He said there is going to be a national forum in June. It, last year it was in May. How many of you are planning to go for this national forum? They will advertise. Usually at the time. It is usually advertised a few weeks before. But last year, and, I, and I'll be very categorical about this, last year when Jiru and I went for that forum, my biggest shock was where are the women? Where are the youth? That whole KICC. No, you can't say no, no. It was in the media. But, no, no. Hold on, hold on. That whole room, you know, the, the MPP theater. Yeah? That MP theater. KICC. It was full of contractors. My Indies, my Kala singers, my contractors. Secretaries, uh, but if I may ask, how many of you have read any article written by Kissing in the papers lately? Okay, that's a very small number. And you see, it is the very same thing that is being said here. People, I think, are not being very proactive. And in one of the articles, we actually were saying that uh, these uh, benefits will not be given to you on a silver platter. Yeah? In as much as the privileges are there, you still need to make an effort to go out and get them. And the other thing which I would just like to emphasize, because I think there was a question of whether um, corruption is a perception or a reality. Um, and I think uh, it is both. It is both uh, because also there has been no survey which has been done in this country that has really established where the, the corruption is. But we all know that it is there. As I said, all of these practitioners are our members, and we train them, we talk to them, we actually launched a code of ethics for them uh, last year, and in that court, it also says that uh, it, is actually, it is actually ethical to make sure that you uh, take care of the local suppliers by making sure that they participate in procurement. Yeah? And um, many of them, even when we are training them, we normally do surveys of them. And we see that they have different perceptions of what morality is. Yeah? And then the other issue that I'd like to say about morality, which is a fact, I think it has been established by studies, is that morality is actually market driven. And the market is actually you. Yeah? So you do have a duty you know, to make sure that when you're participating in procurement also, you are not uh, trying to compromise the procurement people, because that's what we say, it is actually two way. Yes, some are compromisable but also they are being compromised because there are people willing to, to compromise them. Is there a baseline? Do we know where we are? Do we know how many youth are accessing government contracts? You know, so how next year shall we know that we are actually making progress? Is there an m and system? One of the uh, functions of PPU, as I introduced myself, said is compliance, yeah? So that means we actually check the system, that is, uh, we check the procuring entities to ensure that they have complied with the provisions of the law. I think that's another new suggestion, which we got in the last stakeholders forum. I think we are going to, we actually uh, planning to implement it, so that we may now be capturing more data on the people who have won the contract, like the age issue, uh, the, the, the names of directors, and the shareholdings. That's also another critical uh, element. And again, uh, under the Prevalence and the Salvation Scheme, 
2011. There was a provision that for you to be able to participate in these public procurements, you must be registered with the Ministry of Finance, which is now the National Treasury. How many youth businesses, women businesses, and people with disabilities businesses own have registered with the Ministry of Finance? By show of hands. Okay, have you gotten your certificates? Others have gotten, others have not. Uh, I think yesterday, it, it should be yesterday, we got that list of all youth owned. In fact, they, they, they have started with youth, yeah? So all youth owned businesses, already the list has come out. So the list is actually going to be put in our website. And now, therefore, it will be actually those people, it has actually gone further to classify on even the category of the business you registered with. So if you are in Tonas, the Nairobi County, okay, they have, they have used the old system of Nairobi, uh, you have Nairobi province, uh, but again, it's actually within all those uh, counties within those provinces. So it will be now, uh, once those, the, the list is actually put in the website, it will now be comparison that every procurement entity, procuring entity, will actually be using that list to procure, even at the county level. You need to clap for that. Yeah. So finally, the list has come out. The only reason, the, the, the only uh, bad thing is, uh, which I think we need to actually push further, is there's there are some other groups which have been left out here, yeah? so which we actually need to actually push for further so that we can actually include them. Again, if you are again starting a business now, that one does not mean you cannot be able to be put in that list. You can be put in that list and you're given that certificate for two years. So if you need to grow out of that uh, the list of children. So people basically what I'm saying is we do monitor the compliance of this and we actually update the, uh, the, the public and the market on what we have done. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think that's a good beginning, the fact that that list has gone there. But then again, we as the business community are asking, at this time and age when we are asking for simplification, and eradication of too much documentation. Do we still need to go, already you're disadvantaged, then you go and register yourself as disadvantaged. That process itself makes me wonder, why can't we just apply for these jobs? You, on the business questionnaire, you'll be asked, what's your shareholding in this company? If you're, you're a woman, you, there are best practices that we can learn from other countries, how they have done it, because Kenya is not the first one to do it. I have looked at that preference law, we are supposed to actually go to the Ministry of, Finan of, of Finance or Trade? I think both. Finance, and you register yourself there, and now you can hear um, the thing has gone to PPOA, and I don't know whether the, 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 the public uh, companies will be, will be asked that they must give these people businesses. But what about the people who are not on that list and they're in business? We're just asking, is that the best way to implement um, this water. And I do believe, I, I mean, personally, that that would be the majority. Majority of the youth and women and yeah. But let, let me just, let me just add to that. Sorry, let yeah. me just add to that. The reason why that list is critical is because uh, when a procuring entity, and what is a procuring entity? It's any um, institution that receives government funds, yes? Uh, primary schools, uh, hospitals, uh, clinics, and all that, yes? The, Definition of a PE, yeah, excellent. And, and and so that a PE, when a procuring entity wants to say preserve and reserve, one of the biggest problems they were telling us, the reason why they are not doing that is because um, the youth are supposed to compete with the youth, for instance, and women are supposed to compete with women, yes, yeah? and persons with disabilities compete with among themselves. So that when you have a list like that one, you go to the list and you have how many are there? Maybe there are two thousand youth companies, then a procuring or uh, a supplies practitioner is confident in releasing the, the ad knowing that there are people out there who can actually uh, participate in the tender. Are we together? So youth cannot uh, compete with women. Those lists are important to know who is there. That, that's the purpose of the list, so that it, it allows the procuring entity to have some level of confidence that, you know, when they remove, and by the way, at the county level, procurements will be reserved. The tender will say at the bottom, reserved for the youth, or reserved for women, or reserved for persons with disabilities. I think you can only speak the language of a bird if you're a bird. 
there are very many good things going on. And, and I even had a lot of defense for the PPOA for having put it here and not there and full of good information. I'm not fighting PPOA, by the way. We have worked with PPOA before. What I'm saying is, when all this noise comes out that people do not have information, when this group seems not to have gotten some information, it means that maybe the mechanism we're using is not su sufficient to deliver the information to them. When we say we published it on the papers, how many people are reading the papers? Is it much easier to do a radio advert, for example? You know, how many more people listen to radio on their cell phones? You know, those, those small portable radios that they carry, the Pukulu's radio, and all those other things. If if the, 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 the newspapers are not getting to the public with this information, I think it is important that then the strategy is changed. Because this information is extremely important for, for, for all these groups, and not just youth, but all groups of people. I know women in machinery do not read newspapers almost equally to the number of, of, of young people who read newspapers. So do we have another mechanism of reaching out to them? Can you put it, for example, in Facebook? that you read all youth organizations, that work, companies that want to trade with the government should register a treasury. Let the youth find that information there. Some, sometimes that is what you need to do if you want to ensure that affirmative action works. But having said that, having said that, we are also talking to young people and encouraging them to, to be proactive. But you can only be as proactive as a process is open. So the more open it is, the more opportunities for people to decide, let me try this thing out. If I fail, fine. If I succeed, then well, in, I, I, at least I tried. We have to consider those things, and I think for me that communication mechanism is extremely important. You have seen from the room, people have not refused to register businesses. Young people are still willing to register more businesses. Some of them even have five in their names, and some have to be closed down now because they do not even have anything to show for them. The question is, how then do we make this valuable for these groups of people? Uh, you know, my comments are short. So basically, uh, I think she's right, explore other channels of communication, but when we went around uh, the country and talking to the women in particular, they said, and, and, and the people here, and I'm not defending them, uh, I'm very neutral, uh, was very receptive to, to the suggestion. They said, we, we, we don't read newspapers as much as we go to the chief's office. You're bored, Munaweka uko, nafadali, weka uko. So these guys were very receptive and actually took that uh, that um, uh, recommendation, and I believe that this recommendation will be uh, reflected in their in their uh, changes, proposed changes. So uh, again, it has to come from the consumer. The women said they heard, and they <coughs> picked it up. So finally, I am going to throw this uh, to the plenary. I know they have a lot of questions for you, and a lot of uh, issues will come up. They are also experts. They are entrepreneurs here, and uh, I think. Uh, the first question will probably go to this gentleman. If you have a question, comment, uh, please. Consider evolving uh, the issue of uh, capacity building. You cannot actually achieve much with the one person and one person walking over the country teaching people on how to register businesses. I think we have a lot of talent in this country, everywhere in this country. So please see to it that next time you can also identify some people who can also actually deliver this information. I'm throwing my question to, to the legal person on your left. And um, I'm so concerned when it comes to this issue of 30% that it's not uh, well interpreted to us because I'm a layman. And I need to know this 30%, does it concern the youth and the women or plus some disadvantaged, some disadvantaged people and these disadvantaged people are, uh, to be specific, i.e. they are like uh, SME, and how do you define an SME from what, how would you define an SME from what millions, or uh, in terms of uh, finances, how would you define an SME? So we need to be clear, because the laws of, the laws of uh, Kenya are really vague. Kindly, before you put it from the bill to, to a law, make sure it's so specific to us that we know that this 30% belongs to the youth and women. Micro and small enterprises, of course I've uh, had it being uh, correctly pronounced as micro and small enterprises. In the booklet, it says small and medium enterprises. Last year we had uh, the president send to the MSP Act 2012, which actually specifies what all these are. But then when we talk about uh, micro and small enterprises, there is a federation already the, uh, myself, that actually helps us to transit from the youth and, uh, and women in formal sector businesses to the small and medium enterprises sector 
through the micro and small enterprises sector. So we have to be very clear, as the lady has said, as to the definitions. Then uh, that means that uh, we have to link up with themselves um, at one time and then see how can self help the youth and women enterprises to grow. But then secondly, on uh, KISM, the courses that you talked about, can they be put online so that uh, the youth can uh, access it even uh, from remote areas? Otherwise, if, we, if I take the example of uh, CIA, for example, last year CIA County uh, had 2,000 businesses that paid for their licenses. 2,000. That is not even business registration, but business licenses translated in terms of revenue for the county. It means that there are essentially no businesses there if they are all in form of sector businesses. What do we do, uh, Kism? We started as a, this project as a pilot initiative, pilot phase, because before us nobody had even touched this subject. We are talking about last year, May. And now, of course, there's a, because of the, uh, you know, the announcements by the president and the deputy and all these things, there's a lot of sudden interest into public procurement. So we started last year. And when we started last year, we said we don't know enough about what is going on on the ground. And the best way to do this was to really go around the country in those, those five regions that I talked about. Because remember, money is not growing on trees. trees huh? UN Women has to also <coughs> fundraise for whatever it does. It's not a funding agency. It fundraises. Interesting. It, we asked the Ministry of Agriculture to help us, we ask the Women Enterprise Fund to help us, we ask the SII to help us, and the, the, the kind of women we got was really the, the machinani, the grassroots, the, the, the entrepreneurs who are really at the bottom of the bottom, and we were very happy. There was a little bit of mix as well, but majority were farmers, uh, entrepreneurs in the uh, uh, SME kind of uh, definition, if you may say so. We learned lessons. We went around there and we documented and we learned lessons. That's now the women. Apart from that, and, and by the way, let me also correct here. The, when we went to say, for example, uh, uh, Nyanza and we did it in Kisumu, the women were not just from Kisumu. They were from the surrounding uh, uh, counties, surrounding counties. So it was quite widespread. Same with the other regions, not just that one city, surrounding counties. Then when we finished there, we realized, hey, we are talking to women back here. What about this other side? So now we had to, the lessons were telling us that you cannot touch one side of the equation and ignore the other side. That is why we came back to the drawing board and we started partnering with, again with PPU and said, no, we can't solve this major problem without kissing there. So with kissing, now we said, let's talk to the supplies practitioners and find out professionals what is the problem there. And we talked with about 140, I think, uh, in, in uh, 140, right, uh, Hedwig? 140. We started with Nairobi and we are intending, because that was the easiest way to first, you know, start. You have to start somewhere. You can't just start, and he has said and confirmed that most of their membership is actually Nairobi based. So we started with, uh, with, with Nairobi. And we have plans now to move to other areas. But when we finished with them, we said, there's another gap. If we want women and youth to participate effectively and benefit from this, this business is not like other business. If you want to do business with government, you need money to do business with the government. So where are these guys going to get the money to do it? The loans, the credit. So we said, Abu Women Enterprise Fund, let's have a dialogue with financial intermediaries. So we got another forum now targeting financial intermediaries. Um, it was 80 financial intermediaries from all over the country. So it was al almost another 140 because there were 80 and from each there were two, two participants. Again, and there our target was to really help them to realize that we are building the capacity and creating awareness am amongst this youth. We are doing this. But very soon they will be knocking on your doors and saying now we want finance to be able to participate. So you guys have to be ahead of the game and think of products that will meet this emerging need. They have never heard of this. Same with the supplies practitioners, a lot, a majority have not uh, really interacted with these um, regulations that we are talking about. So for us in this pilot learning phase, it has been, you know, move from, you know, learn from each, uh, each key stakeholder in this process. Because if you want to really help the youth and women, you cannot just deal with you and uh, uh, women and youth by themselves. You have to look at the other, who are the contributory, uh, you know, uh, other stakeholders. And then most recently we've had a dialogue with the National Treasury, with the Mr. Cabinet Secretary himself. And in that meeting we have 
I had a three hour conversation with him. That was my first meeting with the cabinet secretary where he sat and listened to us for three hours. And then he said, so what are your recommendations? And, and so we said, the whole, the, the, the entire partnership, we said, this program, now we need to move into serious capacity building. UN Women will still be in the lead of this capacity building program, but we have to find a way or a mechanism of institutionalizing it because it is not my business as you and women to go around. We don't implement. We need a partner that can now pick it up from where we have. We have, we have given birth to, 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 a, to an initiative. Now we need a partner, a very, very strong partner that has presence in all the 47 counties, that has a constituency that it can reach, and that has the, the mechanism on the field, volunteers or whatever, that can run this program. But still, even there, you have to go one step at a time. You need to test whether that approach will work in maybe three, four counties, and then roll it out. But you have to take baby steps. Okay, we have a, a complaint mechanism, and I want to actually mention, as Wajiru was saying, most of us perish because of ignorance, yeah? And actually, it's, it's actually mentioned there, but uh, PPOA, we have an email which I want to give you where you can actually formally complain whenever you feel that the tenering process was not done right. It's info, info at PPOA, info at PPOA.go.ke, info at PPOA.go.ke. Again, you can actually write a, a letter to the Director General, you can write a letter to the Director General requesting for uh, maybe investigation or formally launch your complaint. So therefore, there is a complaint mechanism. Yes, yes. You can also, uh, for those people who have actually tendered, there is another board, which I don't know, you guys don't know about it. I don't know whether you know about it. We have the Public Procurement Administrative Review Board. It's a, a board which actually hears appeals. Yep, that means that if you have received a regret letter from a tendering process uh, that your tender was not successful and you feel that the process was not done right, you can actually launch an appeal. And the appeal should be launched within 14 days from the date you received that letter. Is that okay? But there's a fee for that, yeah? So, yes, yes to, avoid, to avoid free work because some people, let me tell you, People can actually appeal because of you feel you get uh, somebody that you want to facilitate the process. So there is a, a, a fee you pay before launching the, the complaint. But it's actually small. It's around 2,000. Yes, it's around 2,000. Then it, it actually progresses on the amount of the tender. There's a way it's calculated. So if you launch a Ferroveras appeal, there's an appeal we call Ferroveras. Yeah? That's an that's a appeal which you don't put a section of the act which has been violated. So I want to caution you, as you are launching those appeals, kindly mention a section of the act which you feel has been violated. Don't just say that the general process was wrong. Yeah? You clearly must mention a section of the act which has been violated. So therefore, all those complaint mechanisms are there, and the appeal which are launched to ARB are actually providing the law and we act within 30 days. But currently, we are working on around 20, 21 days from the date of launch to the date of hearing and examination of the case. Now, if you have a patent, you go to Kipi or Pasauti, and then you lodge your patent. So, Kipi, so, so a lot of young people complain that their patents will be taken. But it's a critical thing if you have an innovative idea to go and, and, uh, and, and apply for a patent for it. There are several steps that you're going to have to go through. Yeah, um, and then Munalipa is it 2,000 zero? Now the question about the 30 percent is, is important because um, I wish I knew I would have come with the, the law, the regulations, because it's very important for people to understand the regulations. The, the, yeah, yeah. Maybe we can circulate for people to interact with it. The regulations say, call a lot of people say, oh, we don't want to be called disadvantaged. We are not disadvantaged. It's a legal term. It's a legal term that that, that includes within the context of this law, within the context of this law, when you look at the definitions, disadvantaged uh, groups include women, youth, and persons with disabilities. So, when you read the regulations, it says, disadvantaged groups 
and micro and small enterprises. Is that what it says? And it defines micro enterprises as a business undertaking with uh, staff of not more than 10 employees and an annual turnover or investment not exceeding 500,000. That is a micro. It's, it, it's already defined by the law. Small is also defined by the law. And it's consistent with the MSC Act. It's consistent with the county procurement regulations as well. So when we are thinking about public procurement, we really need to think of being inclusive. Yeah? It's not just the youth, because to tell the Kenya Mbele if we're only worried about our ourselves, we really do need to look at this from a very broad-based angle. Yeah? So youth are important, yes, I agree. That's why we are working to make sure that youth are procurement ready. That is why we're also making sure that women are procurement ready, persons with disabilities are procurement ready, small enterprises are procurement ready, and micro are procurement ready. So so if you say it's not for everybody, what are we saying? It's an affirmative action. It is the engine that will take us to Vision 2030. So even at this stage, if we are saying we don't think we want uh, you, you're over 35 and you're a man, I don't think uh, you're covered under this law. What are we saying? Are we together? Because at the end of the day, we, we want to drive this country to where it needs to go. Yeah, because micro and small have always been out of, uh, has always been operating on the margins. They are not in the mainstream. So if this gentleman can add value with his micro enterprise, kuna shida. Akuna shida. Let's let's actually stop this mindset of this is ours. Are we together? Because there's enough. Thirty percent is three hundred billion per financial year. Per financial year. This is a lot of money. And so what happens is that with your micro business, you can supply milk to the primary school, you can supply drugs to the uh, local uh, clinic. You know, you can supply from where you're sitting. Because even if you say 15% is mine, and you cannot supply in Kiambu, are we together? You supply in the county that you're, you're in. Can we start there? Okay. Now, these regulations, the Act, the Procurement Act, allows the Minister of Finance to gazette regulations. I think what we are saying here is that those regulations need a policy framework for implementation. We've even appealed to KISIM to come up with guidelines to support supplies practitioners to give you the procurement. Are we together? So, the law is there, as, as she said, and I agree with her, the law is good, but it's always the implementation angle. The problem is you cannot implement the regulations outside of the law. Are we together? So what we are saying is you develop guidelines pale unasoma tu naona step one, step two, step three, step four, ata kama uko mashinani. Sawa? To supply the local primary school, to supply the local clinic, to supply, you know, na tuanze pole pole. Once you know you can supply chickens to Kaparak University, sindio? 100 chickens per week is not a joke, sindio? And then you go like that, like that, until now, wewe, you are supplying chickens to, to, to Uganda. That's the game plan. We trained a group of uh, 25 people as a pilot. And out of that group, we've been monitoring them. And about five of them have actually secured uh, some uh, tenders or contract to supply the government. Now, the issue as to whether we can actually... Uh, that is 20%. I mean, it is big because, like, if yeah, if we did the same training here, you can translate the numbers. It's like 20%. Yeah. So the training actually does work. Equipping these people with the knowledge, uh, the skills, helps. And actually, one of the modules that you are teaching them was how to prepare a competitive bid. Yeah, which is very key because that is one thing that many people don't know. No matter how simple a bid is. Now, the question of whether we can put this training online, uh, I'm not sure that it's either here, either here or there, because uh, from my experience of training, um, I don't know how many people here have ever taken an online course and completed it. Anyone here? No? Okay, only two people. Yeah. So the, the question is, if we do put a course online, will you take it? We, it's not complicated. <laughs> so we still have to go out and train them. Yeah, but you see the 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 thing which is coming. Many people are coming into this uh, field, and I'm sure that there will be many others who will support the training and capacity building for 
are all disadvantaged groups who want to be trained, and we cannot discuss. Uh, the only uh, trick is because, like the way we trained MSEF, we actually financed 30% as Kissing, and we got another partner, a donor, to finance 70% to build the capacity of our SMEs. And you can clap for us for that. Thank you very much. We are going to take a couple more questions. I think you guys have been sidelined. And I would wish it be very proactive. I like to give you tips. Like I come from a hood where people listen to Shoro FM, Kabena FM. You know the vernacular radio stations. You need to get to that information to those stations because the people that I sit with, they don't really know English that much. Number two, you have been I've been hearing about women and youth, and you, it's like you're carrying it as a blanket term. There are rich women and poor women. There are rich youth and poor youth. I represent poor youth for whose average income, no, it's true, is 100 shillings in a day. When you put an advertisement in a newspaper that costs 50 shillings, it is a challenge to me, because if I buy the newspaper, I will forgo my daily needs. And in the same way, if you are really working for these contracts are supposed to be for the poor people who are in this country, how are you people going to ensure that the people who actually get these contracts are poor women and poor youth? Because I'm foreseeing, I'm seeing a situation whereby the rich women and rich youth will take the contract, and then you people will come and do a press conference and say, oh, we have given out the 30% to all the youth. So we want a, want a system whereby we are going to ensure that my youth who come from Kawangware, I come from Kawangware in Tagoreti, but you call it Upper Lavington or Lower Garden. We want, I want to see my youth actually getting contracts, those contracts. And I want to see a mechanism that actually resolves the contracts for them. When the lady from AIT was talking about reinventing 15%, that part for me is a fact. Because the data is that the rich youth, like the children of our beloved president, they might take those contracts in another way with them. My next question is this, how, you, how are you people going to ensure that these companies are not being fast fronted by government people? Because registering a company just need to provide a few details. You see, and me as a government procurement officer, I can front my child to register a company. You see, that's the corruption we're talking about. And then they get that contract. For you people, that, that company, when you look at the directors, see they are youth. So we want a mechanism that actually ensures that the poor youth and poor women will actually gain access to these contracts. Thank you. I have a question. And my question uh, begins with the fact that I think youth, we don't have access to the top tier of this country, whether it is government, private sector, or even the NGO world. Um, now, the issue around mechanisms to fortify uh, either uh, intellectual property rights of the youth, new ideas, or when an, a youth can see an obvious gap that nobody else can see, does the government have a mechanism by which you can um, you can approach that matter? Because either you can write a project, it ends up in the hands of um, someone who sees the potential, and how do you prevent that hijacking then from happening? From my personal observation is, if you don't fortify the mechanisms, then really how can you bring empowerment? This question goes to Stella. Uh, we have charities and come to people with disability. Like you have said that you put things in the newspaper. Very few people uh, who are deaf normally access the newspaper. And when you put the notice air in the media, you don't have interpreters, so it's hard for us to understand what you want. Uh, 
uh, you're talking too much about women and youth, but when it comes to disability, we have different categories. Uh, so maybe you can explain better what you mean by disabled. Thank you. Are you rich? Do we have rich and poor youth? Yeah. Okay, 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 fair enough. But we know, okay, fair enough, if we have rich and poor youth. If we have rich and poor youth, we need to bring you back together so you can start owning your own institutions. Okay? One of the things that the government is talking about, and you can correct me, is this whole issue of circles. Okay? Banks have not been kind to women, banks have not been kind to youth. So, when banks have not been kind to persons with disabilities, so what is the answer? We have our own institutions that work for us. That is point number one. So, Jukubu Kwenyu, you to start up your own circles. Okay? To start your own parties. I'm not saying it is easy because nothing is easy. Sindio? Yeah. If we want to make sure that youth benefit, instead of being on that side asking for something, Come up with your own institutions where you set your own term. We're in a new constitutional dispensation, we're in a new political dispensation, we're in a new economic dispensation. Let's take charge and come up with our own institutions that serve our own interests. When this program was developed in South Africa, it ended up benefiting the rich people. Yeah? When it, it, this, Kenya is not the first country to, to actually think of the serving of tenders. It has been in play and it actually, what those guys used to do, they take a, a young guy like me. <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm young, yes. Yes. You take a young guy, dress him well, put him in an office somewhere, open for him a, a, a company, an office, pay him well, and the guy will be tendering, he wants everything, but the entire money will be going to this rich. Okay. So what I'm actually saying is this, guys, we also have a role to play. People, we are going to monitor the compliance, as we shall be checking mostly on the paperwork, because there is actually nothing. In terms of operation of proxy, there is no way you can be able to check operations under proxy. It actually becomes very hard, because unless you do other advanced forensic audits. But now what I want to actually tell us I uh, tell you guys, we have a role to play. The role we have is this. If you know that there is a business which you know it's actually being operated by other people, you can actually, do, once this thing is gazetted, we have that law, once it's gazetted, you can actually be able to report all those companies so that we can actually be able to start investigating. Is that okay? It actually, it will actually become very hard for people to know these are huge, uh, uh, rich youth and these are poor. I want to actually appreciate the, the, the two young people here who have spoken uh, you know, from a different perspective, the, 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 the gentleman in blue and the lady next to him. And why am I saying this is because when we were going around the forums, we made a deliberate effort, very humbly we made a deliberate effort to reach out also to the physically, uh, uh, I mean persons with disabilities. And it was a very big challenge because uh, you know, we, we learned a lesson. When we invited the women to come for the forums, we had a couple who came and they were physically disabled. So those we were able to accommodate. But we also had cases where we had a few situations where they were uh, visually impaired or hearing impaired and we were not able to, uh, unfortunately at that time, accommodate them in our sensitization and awareness raising. And for me that was a very big lesson learned that you know what, we have to go back to the drawing board and say, yes, we are doing awareness creation, we are sensitizing people, but not everybody. I mean, we have to look at, we have to look at it a bit more uh, holistically. And so the message we came back and gave this, uh, our, our colleagues here, PPOA and Kissim and others, is also remember the other, uh, you know, other, not, other groups, of, groups of people and then think about how can we reach them with information because you, we have to develop tools and messages and, uh, you know, channels of, of communicating which reach, which reach out to everybody. So I hope that, uh, you know, we have started, as I said, I repeat this, that we have started with awareness creation, we have started with sensitization, now we are moving to phase two, which is capacity building 
And when I talk about capacity building, we are now saying we are going to train people like what Kisim has done, how to do business with government, how to tender, how to how to meet the eligibility criteria, how to become a formal business because you cannot do business if you are not formal, all those how to, how to, how to. Yeah. But I think that the gentleman who had the newspaper in his hand, and you just re reminded me of something, that when we are doing capacity building, and this is why partnerships are so important because no one institution is good and can do everything. So even us we, we, we need partners who can, we start with this, we do this, and others come in and help with another thing, another element. And what is this element I'm talking about? I'm talking about quality, uh, you know, certifying products so that you can match the requirements of the market. And here we have a big problem. Youths and others fail the test because the products are not quality products as per the specification required. And we had this very, very heated dis the, the discussion with Kim, I hope you will talk about it. Uh, and uh, that tells us that, you know what, the, uh, the uh, youths and women entrepreneurs have to go a step a notch higher. Production by itself is not enough. Now you have to think about quality production. So you can, you know, it, 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 it goes a bit higher. And then you think about certifying your products, going to cabs, Kenya, uh, what is it, Kenya uh, Bureau of Statistics to get that stamp. If you go to Nakumet, all those products have those stamps, those bars, the bar coding, which means this is certified and it's a quality product. Nobody can challenge. So we have to think beyond the box. Remember that this is uh, an animal farm, survival for the fittest and the fattest. So if you expose your idea too early, when you have not secured the resources to implement it, you cannot blame anybody who has the means from doing it because the opportunity was available for them. How, at what point do you talk about your idea? How much of it do you disclose? To whom are you disclosing it to? You cannot disclose the idea, for example, to a competitor and expect that they're going to sit down and just wait for you to get money and implement the idea. So we have to access a certain level of wisdom. But where, where it is an innovation, like you have been told, uh, you need to then uh, remember to always go and, and, and register your intellectual property and ensure that you patent whatever it is that you think you want um, uh, to receive royalties in the future for. Um, I think having said that, I've most, uh, mostly responded to your question. The other one was from the lady at the front here about communication. I think yourself and the gentleman from Kawangwari have explained exactly what I was trying to say in so many words about the, the mechanism for communication of some of these messages by the government. Ideally, what we are saying is that it needs to be diversified. Even as we speak here, I'm worried that there, there are groups of people in this room who we may not have spoken to entirely, 100%. They missed a good portion of the conversation. So what are we saying? If these messages are for the public, let them be delivered in English and Swahili, number one. Let them be delivered in places where the public can access them. And let them be delivered in a mechanism through which normal, uh, 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 normally we would get information. So for example, the newspaper, Advert, would be a good one on a, on a paper that is mostly read. So that most groups who get information from the paper do not complain that you did not put it on the paper. But let that information then be cascaded into other places. We personally, as, as Africa Youth Trust, any time we advertise anything on paper, including many uh, UN women supported adverts that we have done, we always put it on our Facebook page. So I'm welcoming PPOA to share any information that you want to share with the youth. We have a lot of traffic on our youth, uh, youth Employment Initiative Facebook page and the general AIT Facebook page. We'll be willing to share all that information. And for the young people who are sitting in this room, I don't think PPOA has to come to your home to deliver the information that we have been sitting through this entire conversation. Go out of this room, when you sit in the Matatu, can you post something about this entire conversation? If you're asked a difficult question, you have been told how you can reach PPOA, you know how you can reach all the panelists. If you don't, we will tell you. Ask those questions, share information with your colleagues, so that everybody knows what is happening. Do not keep it to yourself. Keep, keep the, the idea of your business to yourself, but at least tell everyone that there's an opportunity that they can benefit from. Talking about rich women and poor women and young and rich young people and, and poor youth. What I think the youth and the women and everybody in this country needs to do is to work as one. Like she said, there is enough for everybody. PPOA has said that when you move from the 30%, there is the other 70%. You're supposed, as an entrepreneur, you're supposed to be asking yourself, how do I move from the next level to the next level? You're not supposed to stay in one place forever. You're supplying 100 chicken in the village, you should now aspire to supply 500 in the county and 1,000 to the national government. So the thing is this, the ones who are living in lower current, 
and is it Upper Lavington? What you need to do, find a way of partnering. In fact, I'll tell you one of the ways as a business person to become rich is to partner with rich people. Yeah. Yeah? Form strategic partnerships because you know what? You don't have the capacity to supply on your own. I'm not able to build a road. I have. I mean, I look at Manuchendari and wonder how can I be there? One of the ways I can be there is by looking at seeing what is that little thing I can do with you. Even if it is to supply waste paper to Chandari Industries so that he makes the toilet paper we did. I cannot hate him for getting the tender, but if he gets it, he will give me the order, he will subcontract me to supply him. So what we need to do is reach out to this mentorship, something called mentorship for instance. Yes. You will be surprised to hear that a lot of successful people in business are willing to mentor the starters. And starting, you can be an old woman, but an, a, a startup in a business, isn't it? You need mentoring from even a young woman who has been in business for a longer time than you. So the best thing to do is have strategic partnerships and alliances. Work with those so-called rich people. Knock on their door. I want to tell you, 99% of the times that door will be opened. They will open and listen and tell you how to fill those tender documents, how to even go for that job. Because most of the times, the tender you want is not the tender I want. So for me, not showing you how to fill the tender documents or not assisting you how to get that tender does not help you. So reach out to those so-called rich the experienced the 30% is just a reservation. It's what has been ring fenced. But the 70% are we together? So we shouldn't get confused that the 30% is only for women and youth because the 70% is for Kenya. It's just that they've ring fenced the 30%. So it's already an affirmative action of sorts. Perhaps, and we have already put in a proposal to to, to PPOA is that because what I'm saying is let's focus on the county level. I'm getting worried that we are mixing apples and oranges here. There's county and national. So at the, at the, 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 the reservation scheme will be applied at county level. So what are we proposing to PPOA? That at county level, yeah, we have this uh, list. This list should be for the, for the county treasury. Are we together? Instead of coming to Ministry of Finance to submit your 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 name, you do it at your county at your county level. Then we are also proposing that the performance contracts at the county level are the ones that trap implementation. Are we together? So that we don't lose what this ring fencing is about. It is our governors, and that's why I'm saying at some point in time you need to engage your governor as the youth or women or persons with disabilities because they are the duty bearers. They are the ones who we will go to when this doesn't work. Are we together? We are not going to PPOA. PPOA will go to check compliance. I actually had two punchlines. <laughs> but I'll give you one combined uh, hybrid punchline. Mine was targeting directly the youth. Number one, do not look at the separation between rich and poor youth. Partner. Partner, 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 partner with people who have money so that you can be able to access procurement. Once you access procurement, tafadhali, tafadhali, tafadhali. We are the ones who have the most access to KLI, Karibangi Light Industries, and we may be tempted to supply low quality goods to government. If you deny tenders ever again, do not blame anyone and do not come singing the song of youth. But number three, information, information, information. I may have made so much noise for information to be brought to you. But you cannot afford to sit down as a young person and wait for information to come to you. Get up, go out, look for information. If you do not know what to do with that information, come and look for me. If you don't find me in my office in Kilendesha, we have an office in town, uh, City Council Annex, uh, Annex office. We have an entire computer lab. If you want to browse, get information on business, we have it there. If you have a group that needs information on business, contact us and we're going to talk to you. Come and conduct an information meeting for your group and share as much information as you can. With your group, something. Okay, so mine is uh, that we have a duty. We need to push. We need to push for this uh, decree or this promise that we have been given to be entrenched in the law. Whatever method we use, whoever it is that we need to talk to, let's ensure that it's entrenched in the law. And then after that, let us demand for data. Let us demand to be told 
what has been bought from who. So that we can measure and know, is it working? Has the 30% gone where it was supposed to go? Let's not go the South Africa way. I think we need to learn and let the stakeholders be involved. Why the preference law sometimes has issues is because the law was made without involving the users, the consumers. That's why we don't even know about it. Thank you. Punchline? Yes, punchline. <laughs> punchline. With punchline, okay. For me, the punchline is um, a plan without provision is really bad. But a vision without action is even worse. So the, the message I want to you know, depart with from here is that please, all of you, read, 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 participate, citizen participation, participate, participate, and then don't forget to act because without action, it's all useless. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Okay, what I'll be able to say the final word is uh, PPO is going to actually ensure there's compliance on those new regulations in case they come and on the existing regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for me, it's a call to action. Um, like I said, we are a capacity development firm. Uh, we are in the business of capacitating people, training and building capacities to ensure two things. People understand devolution. What is your role in devolution in terms of citizen participation? Because again, by the way, if you don't understand devolution, it's going to be difficult for you to participate in public procurement. So those are two things that we're very passionate about at Social Impact. Uh, training youth, women, persons with disabilities, so-called marginalized. And people who have not been in the system, to be in the system through understanding devolution and how they can benefit from it, understand public procurement and how you can benefit from it. Again, www.sii-africa.org. We have a couple of blogs there, okay? Just look at the couple of blogs that we've put there. Now, I also want to say that we are in the business of partnering. Anybody here who feels they want to partner with us as youth and whatever, Sawa, tuko pamoja, tutafanya kazi pamoja because hii kazi ya hizi fanyuwa na 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 here or 6. It cannot. And we are happy to support you in what you are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe we've had a very, very interesting discussion. And I hope that we can take this forward on Twitter, Facebook, on email. Uh, let's please continue interacting and let's partner. I believe that is uh, very important. Now, I'm going to invite uh, our host, uh, uh, Joan Urika from Heinrich Paul Foundation. I'll invite her to come and close the meeting. And then, uh, I want to thank you very much for your patience, for your great participation, great questions. Um, and I want to thank the panelists uh, for very ably handling uh, a lot of difficult questions and being there to actually provide you know, some interesting insights and knowledge that we really require. Thank you very much. I am very grateful. Can we give a very, very long and loud applause? I think for very ably, ably managing this forum, it's, it's, I have not seen this room this packed. I think I'm told we are nearly 450 people in this room. That tells you that this information, ladies and gentlemen, must keep going out. But we have 450 more people to reach out to 10 more. So I think uh, it's worth our time. I thank you, Mr. Kimiti, again. Panelists, from the end to the end, thank you, Mr. Hedwig Nyalwal of KISM. Thank you, Anjiro Gadira of SII-Africa.org. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Harun Moti from PPOA for all the hard work that you're putting in and we are expecting more. Thank you, you and women, for reaching out also to Heinrich Hall to partner in some of these things, and thank you very much for making time to be with us today. Um, Felicity, we aim to be like you and beyond in the, in the big people's club. It's no longer boys' clubs. <laughs> You're not there yet. Be humble, it's okay. <laughs> and thank you so much, Stella Araga. Araga. Ar Sorry, Stella Agara from the uh, Africa Youth Trust. We appreciate their time, and we appreciate the fact that it was such a mix that we could actually engage on all fronts. Nobody was missing here to be told they should be doing. You know how it goes, they haven't done, but we were all together here, and I believe you've been walking through counties and other places as a team like this. It's very, very healthy and helpful. Keep doing this. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I want to also appreciate you all and allow me to ask you to clap for yourselves, for all of us <laughs> benefiting from this knowledge. Um, just to wrap us up, time is much gone and I know I've been hearing a lot of whispers on my corner there. This is not enough time, we need a half a day, we need a full day, we need more, we need more. Which is good. That means that uh, this debate needs to continue. Forums such as this, like you have seen, supply management uh, uh, practitioners have organized in their group. We have women organized in groups, we have other people organized or at least having champions through people like the Youth uh, Trust and others, start to organize. In your small little groups, you're maybe supplying certain goods come together. It could be that you can actually pull together to actually access some of these things so that you break into that uh, very hard domain, which is soon going to be softened a little bit for us. So I don't want to repeat any taglines, what do we call them, punchlines at the end, but I remember something that uh, I think I'll take with me. Get ready, get set, tender, tender, tender. Engage, engage, engage. Partner, partner, partner. And look for the information rather than waiting for the information. I think that is a good wrap to say we are more informed. At least we also have new partners. The people sitting around you, I have at least 10 business cards myself. And that means I've made new contacts of people that can actually be helpful. God bless you all. I think uh, Mr. Kimiti had mentioned he's actually a singer on the side. He's a vocalist. I was very surprised. I just feel we need to end with the national anthem. I just feel that way. Mr. Kimiti. E mungungu yetu Ilete baraka kwetu Haki wenga ona mlinzi Na tukae na undugu Amani na uhuru Raha tupate na ustawi Thank you very much.